Hey everybody, and welcome back to History Student Reacts. Today we'll be watching Vercingetorix by Historius Villus. So this is a continuation of the revolt in Gaul that Caesar has been dealing with. I'm really excited to get into this one. I'm familiar with Vercingetorix, but it has been uh, a while since uh, I've watched anything about him. So I'm really excited to get a refresher on this very uh, exciting episode of Roman history. Uh, if you guys end up enjoying this video, I'd appreciate it if you would check out the Patreon, which is linked down below and has exclusive content. And without any further ado, let's jump into this reaction. Spooky. <laughs> In the dead of winter, deep in the forest, the leaders of some of the largest tribes in Gaul met at a sacred grove. Mm. Together, they discussed Ambiorix's revolt from the previous year. Some of those present had supported the revolt by saying- A revolt that definitely challenged the Romans, though, um, you know, they ended up succeeding. Uh, the Romans ended up maintaining their domination over Gaul. But it was a pretty impressive revolt in many ways. Sending fighters or supplies, while others had decided to sit back and see how it all played out. But Ooh. as we know, after some initial success, the mm. revolt had gone down in defeat. Yeah. The Gallic tribes had been curious to see whether this would be a wake-up call for the Romans, but it was kind of the opposite. Caesar doubled down and attacked any tribal leader that didn't show him blind loyalty. He indiscriminately killed and enslaved Gallic civilians. It was a brutal show of force. I mean, yeah, we've been seeing how Caesar behaves in Gaul, and I mean, one of his favorite tactics is marching around, burning down villages, murdering and enslaving civilians uh, in order to get a response from different Gallic tribes. So, um, you know, he has managed to effectively dominate the territory. But of course, and I've mentioned this before, the morality of the actions uh, is very much uh, not good. You know, we're talking about some really brutal, really bad stuff going on here. Um, but, you know, these are the tactics that Caesar has used in order to extend Roman conquest. <clears throat> now, the Gallic leadership was in agreement. Caesar was clearly laying the groundwork for full annexation. Yep. The time for secrecy was coming to an end. Together, the tribal leaders swore a sacred oath. Gallic independence or death. Nothing wow. else. The tribes would formally unite against the Roman invaders. I mean, this is a, I mean, at least at this moment, a big deal. You know, we've talked about how, um, I mean, the only way to fight back against the Romans was the unification of these different tribes. This was true for Gaul and Britain, though, you know, even in a case like Britain where the tribes did unify, the Romans came out basically on top at the end. So, you know, unifying, it's not a guarantee that you'll defeat the Romans, but it's your only chance. You know, if you have tribes rising up independently, they don't stand, you know, a chance. They've got, uh, you know, no chance in hell to beat the Romans. They have to come together. Uh, and clearly, you know, they've already known that, and now they're, seems like they're putting it into action, though, a lot of these coalitions do end up falling apart, so we'll see if that happens with this one. But at the very least, they're seeing that we don't have much time left, you know? If we're going to try and prevent this annexation, we have to do it now. We have to come together immediately. One of the people present at this meeting was a tribal leader named Vercingetorix. In only a few months, this man would rise to become the leader of a united Gallic army. Yep. Famous guy. It was no coincidence that as soon as these Gallic leaders returned home, things started happening. A Roman trading outpost in central Gaul was stormed, and its inhabitants were massacred. Coincidentally, a bunch of small Gallic tribes with ties to Caesar suddenly came under attack at the same hmm. time. Coincidence, Caesar's huh? right-hand man Labinus was in charge of the legions while Caesar was gone south for the winter. When reports of these attacks started coming in, Labinus had a pretty lazy response. Ooh. He kept the Roman soldiers in their winter quarters. And you know, Labinus is a smart guy. He's a pretty capable guy. So, uh, one, I mean, that's definitely a mistake. But two, 
it does give you uh, sort of a look at the Roman mindset at the moment, at how confident and dominant they felt that Labinus couldn't even be bothered to put up much of a response. And instead sent Rome's strongest Gallic ally to go and deal with the problem. These Gauls dutifully marched off, but after a few days they turned around and came back home, claiming that the countryside was too dangerous. Mm. That's a thin excuse if you ask me. Yeah. It's telling that even Rome's strongest Gallic ally was suddenly unwilling to lift a finger against their fellow Gauls. Hmm. Back in Roman territory, Caesar was watching the reports come in with growing concern. It was still winter, but just to be on the safe side, he decided to head back north early. As he was making preparations to leave, he learned that there was a Gallic army marching toward Narbo, the largest city in Transalpine Gaul. This was a big deal. Narbo was a major Roman city. If Caesar couldn't prevent attacks like this, the entire rationale behind his intervention into Gaul was thrown into question. I mean, that's exactly right. Caesar has, you know, basically gone on this conquest of Gallic territory that seemingly is leading up to annexation to have, you know, a Gallic army sack a city firmly in Roman territory. That would be a big blow to his overall mission and something that he needs to prevent desperately. The legions in Gaul were too far away, so Caesar grabbed some untrained raw recruits and some people from the local militia and marched to Narbo's aid. At this time, the Alps had a reputation for being impassable during the winter, but mm. after some hard work, Caesar's men were able to clear a path through one of the passes. Nice. When the Gauls approaching Narbo heard that a Roman army had made it through the Alps, they pulled back. Caesar reached Narbo, and then sent out his horsemen all over the countryside to cause as much disruption as possible. He hoped that this would convince the Gauls that he had a proper army with him, and mm. not a ragtag group of idiots who couldn't hold their own in a fight. Smart. Just to reiterate, three things had just happened. First, Roman merchants in Gaul were being rounded up and massacred. Second, Rome's Gallic allies were under attack. Third, the Gauls were threatening Roman territory for the first time in years. These things had to be related. Gaul was obviously on the march, and Caesar was stuck hundreds of kilometers from his legions. Mm. Caesar left Narbo behind and headed north, accompanied by only a small group of bodyguards. One of our ancient sources makes a passing reference to Caesar riding through enemy territory disguised as a Gaul. There's no context given to this anecdote, so we don't know when it happened, but I read one historian that makes a convincing argument that it happened here. Anyway, the small group rode with urgency, and after several tense and exhausting days, Caesar reunited with his legions. He mobilized all ten legions, and ordered two, presumably the two inexperienced ones, to guard their food stockpile. Once again, we are seeing the importance of supply lines and supplies. Um, you know, I'm not sure if this is going to come into play later, but you definitely do want those supplies guarded, particularly if you're going to end up uh, in deeply hostile territory. Um, Though, Caesar has the foresight to see that, and clearly, uh, unlike Labinus in this case, Caesar has the foresight to realize that uh, something fishy is going on, and that uh, he needs to be up there, you know, back in Gaul, to make sure that everything doesn't fall apart. <laughs> Remember, it was still winter, and the Gauls who usually supplied the Romans were under attack. This mm. meant that the food that the Romans had set aside for the winter might have to last them all year. It had to be protected at all costs. Yeah. Caesar took the remaining eight legions and marched straight into central Gaul. By this time, all of the internal conflict within the Gallic alliance had been resolved, and Vercingetorix had emerged as the unrivaled leader of a united Gallic army. Mm. The Gauls were lucky to have him. Vercingetorix was a brilliant guy and a student of Roman warfare. He knew how to defeat the Romans. Vercingetorix's strategy was basically the Fabian strategy. Mm. The Fabian strategy is all about attrition. The goal is for one army to deprive the other of food, supplies, and reinforcements until they become beatable on the battlefield. In short, Vercingetorix's goal was to make Caesar's life as miserable as possible. 
And I mean, this is, it's a really smart idea, especially in this situation. Clearly, Vercingetorix is worried that he won't be able to take the Romans in a one-on-one -on -one fight. And fair enough, the Romans are a pretty imposing force. Um, so that points towards the strategy. Uh, in addition, the Romans are in uh, maybe not unfamiliar territory. They've been here for a while, but basically hostile territory, you know. Um, they have to protect their supplies. They're surrounded by Gauls. And so that also makes this strategy even more effective. Um, Vercingetorix can avoid these big, massive-scale battles while, you know, using hit-and-run attacks, you know, trying to deprive the Romans of supplies, uh, making it so that over time they become unable to fight and perhaps unable to survive. That's the goal. So it's, uh, you know, it's a smart strategy to go with. There are some downsides, particularly um, political downsides. Um, you know, this is not the most glamorous strategy, and that can make... Uh, you know, people around you upset, uh, you know, if you, you know, need popular support or even the support of your army, uh, sometimes they are not a fan of this sort of strategy, but it is very intelligent. So when Caesar marched into central Gaul, Vercingetorix ordered over 20 nearby towns evacuated. People were allowed to take whatever they could carry, but anything left behind was burned. Mm. Vercingetorix's opening move was to go full scorched earth. Yeah. Caesar had to be denied the ability to resupply. The refugees flocked to the largest settlement in the region, the fortified city of Avericum. Caesar and his legions advanced toward the city, and Vercingetorix and his united Gallic army shadowed him. Hmm. Avericum was said to be impregnable. The city was protected by strong, high walls, as well as marshes on three sides. These marshes were a nightmare for any besieging army, since it was virtually impossible to stop people from sneaking through the marshes whenever they pleased. Even under siege, Avericum could remain supplied indefinitely. The mm. city would need to be taken by force. I mean, usually in order to stay supplied during a siege, uh, you would need, I mean, the best way to do it is sort of an open water route because it uh, can be very difficult to blockade, but of course this is uh, very interior, you know, um, and yet they still managed to stay supplied due to the uh, environment, so uh, that could be pretty well defended over a long period of time. The Romans built their camp on the only side of the city with dry land and settled in. This is known to history as the Siege of Avericum, and it was miserable. The whole thing would last 27 days, and it would rain the entire time. <laughs> Caesar ordered his men to begin building two siege towers and a gigantic wooden frame upon mm. which the Romans could build a ramp out of earth and mud. Once completed, this ramp would allow the Romans to charge up and over the walls of Avericum. But because of the torrential rain, construction ran into difficulties. Mm. At some point during this process, the Romans officially ran out of food. Uh -oh. I don't mean they were forced to cut rations. I mean they ate their last meal and then were literally out of food. Jesus. Uh, I mean, I knew the situation was bad. I did not realize it was that desperate. I mean, that is, that's past desperation. You were literally in survival mode. You know, you are now, every day is a risk, you know. Um, of course, you're probably not going to be eating a lot of days. Uh, eventually, you know, <laughs> you're in a place where you need food. You don't know how to get it, but you need to do something. Um, this is, you know, past desperate. Although, uh, I would imagine, or maybe they don't. I thought they still had those supplies, food supplies that they were defending. Um you know, maybe they could draw on that if those were still there. <clears throat> Persingetorix really hit the nail on the head when he prevented Caesar from looting those towns. Now, the Romans were beginning the slow process of starving to death, and the nearest food was inside the walls of Avericum. Mm. This was a bad place to be. Caesar sent foraging parties out in the rain and the mud to try and find something edible to take the edge off. 
When Vercingetorix noticed this, he moved his army nice and close to the Romans, and sent out Gallic patrols all over the countryside, which denied the Romans the ability to forage. I mean, we saw the same thing in Britain. <clears throat> you know, Caesar was very low on supplies. He sent his men out to forage, but he was in unfamiliar, hostile territory. Uh, and, you know, British raiders would, you know, strike his foraging parties and either kill them or force them to retreat. So very little food could actually be found. Vercingetorix's goal of making Caesar's life as miserable as possible was going great so far. Understandably, this made the Romans pretty upset. <laughs> they tried to provoke the Gallic army into attacking them, but Vercingetorix didn't take the bait. Smart. All he had to do was sit back and wait for the Romans to make a mistake. Now, you may be asking yourself, if Caesar's legions were starving, why didn't he send for the food right. that he was keeping under guard back that's, east? That's what I was if wondering. If Caesar sent for it now, Vercingetorix would do everything in his power to intercept the shipment. That food had to last the Romans all year, and if they lost it now, they would be forced to pull out of Gaul entirely. Still I guess, but, um, you know, they are extremely desperate, so maybe it's time. <laughs> um, you know, I mean, if you're literally on the verge of starvation, it might be time to use that final supply of food. Um, you know, unless you think you can storm the city and get more food that way, but, you know, the Romans are in a bad spot right now. Though, I think it's reasonable to second-guess Caesar's decision to leave the food behind. If he regretted this, he had plenty of time to sit around and beat himself up over it. Hmm. But despite their hunger and the relentless rain, the Romans were almost finished construction. Vercingetorix could see this, so he turned to his army and asked for 10,000 volunteers. Whoa. He sent them around the Romans and through the marsh into the city. With the help of Vercingetorix's men, the defenders of Avericum began to improve their defenses. <laughs> As the Roman ramp approached the height of the wall, the Gauls inside Avericum began to use wooden planks to extend their wall even higher. Oh, that's it great. It was now a race to see which army could build faster. This back and forth extended the siege for several days. Then, in the middle of the night, the Romans on guard duty discovered to their dismay that their ramp was smoldering and sinking into the ground. The Gauls were getting creative, and after digging a tunnel under their walls, they had started a fire from underneath the ramp. They are sneaky, you know, Vercingetorix and his men, they clearly understand Roman tactics and how the Romans do things, uh, and, uh, you know, they're, they've got tricks up their own sleeve, you know? Um, very smart. Some very uh, good decision-making here on their end. The wooden frame was slowly starting to cave in on itself. Hmm. Very clever. Yeah. Without warning, the Gauls burst from the gates. They were carrying torches and buckets of tar. They started to set all of the Roman siege equipment on fire. If they could completely destroy the ramp tonight, the Romans would be done for. Mm. The Romans on guard duty quickly pulled the siege towers back to safety and then rushed forward to defend the ramp. The rest of the army was roused from sleep and scrambled to help. The two sides spent the rest of the night fighting for control of the ramp, with the Gauls setting fire and the Romans frantically putting them out. <laughs> it was chaos. When the sun rose the next day, the ramp was singed and sagging but still functional. The Romans spent all day patching it up and raising it the last couple of feet. By the time the sun set, they were finally ready to begin the assault. All right. The next day, the rain was horrendous. The ground turned into one giant puddle, and every soldier had to fight against the thick, nasty mud with every step. No sane person would take an army out in this. Caesar decided to go ahead with the assault anyway. Remember, the Romans were starving to death. They couldn't give the Gauls another opportunity to destroy their equipment. They had to go now. Yeah. The I mean, not the right conditions, but in this situation, you've really not got much of a choice if you're the Romans. Um, I, I, I agree with this course of action. You just need to try and assault the city immediately and, uh, you know, change the situation you're in. Get some food. Romans fought their way up the ramp and onto the walls of Avericum. 
Apparently the Gauls were not expecting an attack in this kind of weather, but nevertheless mm. they rallied and fell back to their second defensive line down on the streets. Instead of following, the Romans stayed up on the walls and spread out, eventually surrounding the defenders down below. Every Roman legionary carried two javelins, and this was a pretty good time to use them. Hmm. The Gauls down on the streets could see that escape was no longer an option. After enduring an onslaught of projectiles from the Romans, they started to lose hope. Many ran off. Yeah, I mean, that is uh, some smart thinking from the Romans. You know, they approached the city, and of course, the Gauls made the assumption we're going straight into urban warfare. We're going to be fighting street by street, block by block. But instead of jumping right in, the Romans decided to take a minute, think about what we're doing, and surround them instead. I mean, it would have been very easy to just, you know, keep pushing and, and, you know, continue into the melee of the city streets, but this was definitely a, a good decision. ...to hide in their homes. The Romans came down off the walls and easily crushed the remaining resistance. Then the legionaries roamed the streets and indiscriminately oh, slaughtered civilians. Yeah, I mean, it's not Caesar in Gaul if you don't have your fair share of uh, brutality and massacres. <laughs> that, uh, you know, really characterizes a lot of these videos. Virtually all of the city's inhabitants were killed. Jesus. Caesar made no attempt to stop them. Uh, yeah, of course. With the Romans victorious and recovering their strength in the city, Vercingetorix decided to pull back. He was certainly disappointed with the loss of Avaricum, but he was playing the long game. The Romans had paid a heavy price to take the city. Vercingetorix would sit back and wait until Caesar made his next move. Mm. It was now officially springtime, and with Vercingetorix's army out of his hair, Caesar was finally able to send for the two legions back east, and <laughs> the food that they were guarding. Finally! <laughs> Caesar then took a gamble, and sent a message to Rome's strongest and last Gallic ally, asking if they could spare any food. Except he probably didn't phrase it like that, because all Romans were patronizing jerks. Yeah, this is Roman diplomacy. Nothing was ever asked for. It was demanded. And it was usually given. <laughs> this tribe was unreliable. Remember, this was the same tribe that had refused to take up arms against their fellow Gauls earlier in the year. Nevertheless, they told Caesar that they would see what they could do. When the legions arrived from the east, Caesar divided his army in two. He gave four legions to his right-hand man, Labinus, and ordered him to march north. Caesar would take the remaining six legions and march south. Between the two of them, maybe they could put an end to this revolt by the end of summer. Maybe. To the south, Caesar's main target was the Gallic city of Gergovia. This was Vercingetorix's hometown and the capital city of his tribe. If the Gauls lost here, it would be a huge symbolic <clears throat> defeat. As Caesar marched south, Vercingetorix began shadowing his army again, harassing it whenever he could. When Caesar reached Gergovia, he slowly started to realize that this might be tougher than Avericum. Mm. The city of Gergovia had strong walls and was located on a giant raised plateau surrounded by hills. On the slope leading up to the plateau sat Vercingetorix and 30,000 of his closest friends. <laughs> I love that phrasing. Um, another strong defensive position from the Gauls. Will Caesar manage to get past this? Uh, Vercingetorix and his tens of thousands of uh, close friends? <laughs> I guess we'll see. Remember, Caesar's food situation was still a problem. They had their supplies from the east, but if that was going to last, it had to be supplemented by looting and foraging. They couldn't afford to just sit around for the whole summer. They had a food shipment on its way from their Gallic allies, but these guys were unreliable, so yeah. who knew when they would show up? All things considered, they would probably have to storm the city like last time, which was risky. But before doing that, they would have to fight this Gallic army standing in their way. Uphill. Yeah, this was going to be ugly. After doing some reconnaissance, Caesar realized that there was a Gallic garrison on top of a small hill nearby. Caesar launched a nighttime raid to capture the hill, and mm. was successful. 
Once they had the hill, the Romans figured out that the garrison had been protecting a small stream, which served as Gergovia's only source of water. Uh. The Romans cut off the stream and dug a long defensive trench from the hill all the way back to the Roman camp. Now, the Gauls would have to act, and the Romans were ready for them. Very smart. Some classic Caesar, you know, tricky maneuvers. He was always great at these. Um, you know, presented with a situation in which there is a clear uh, option, Caesar would always make his own option, <laughs> which would uh, usually be better and more intelligent than the obvious route forward. But then a messenger arrived from the Northeast. He told Caesar that there had been a problem with the food shipment. Uh -oh. The Gallic tribe that was going to deliver it, Rome's last Gallic ally, had turned on them without warning. They were... Well, I don't know if without warning is accurate. I'm not entirely surprised this would happen. They were a little flaky already, and, you know, it's not really that surprising that they would have turned against Rome or not delivered the food or just flaked on it. There's a couple of different things that could have happened. ...were massacring any Romans they could find. Whoa. This That's was a bigger pretty radical. than you might think. The food shipment was protected by thousands of Gallic cavalry, and now they were threatening the Roman rear. This was bad. After some consideration, Caesar marched off with four legions, leaving two behind to continue the siege. By nightfall, he tracked down his rogue Gallic allies. When the Gauls saw Caesar coming, they sent a representative forward, claiming hmm. that it was all a misunderstanding. Oh, of, yeah. Of course, this... I mean, I don't know who this tribe is, but, you know, to be the last Roman ally in this situation, they're definitely trying to play both sides. Um, you know, maybe they didn't actually turn against Rome, and that was all rumors. Um, seems maybe more likely that they did, and then perhaps had a change of heart, or wanted to, you know, win the favor of their fellow Gauls by killing some Romans and then come right back to the Romans and say, uh, that was all a misunderstanding, Caesar. Don't worry about it. We're here to help. <laughs> they had received some bad information and had believed that Caesar was slaughtering members of their tribe. Really? Do you buy this? No. I don't buy it. <laughs> this was the same tribe that had refused to march against their fellow Gauls. Yeah. It seems clear to me that they were at least sympathetic to Vercingetorix's cause and were looking for an excuse to jump ship. Mm. Caesar had no way of knowing if he was being lied to, and frankly, he didn't really have time to figure it out. He told the Gauls that if they wanted to prove their loyalty, they could come with him and join the siege. So the next morning, Caesar's four legions returned with several thousand semi-treacherous Gauls. <laughs> that is a, uh, well, that's a dangerous position to be in. I mean, it is true that he absolutely needs the men, and at a time like this, you cannot be picky with your allies. But, you know, their very questionable loyalty could end up being a disadvantage if they decide to turn against the Romans, like, in the midst of battle. So it's a risky decision, but I can, you know, definitely see why he did it. First off, he needs the support. Second off, he probably wants to keep them close so he can keep an eye on them. When he got back to the siege, he was told that the two legions he had left behind had been under constant attack from the moment he left. They'd held their ground, but it'd been a rough 24 hours. There were also new developments on the slope leading up to the city. Mm. There was a brand new stone wall there, six feet Whoa. high. Also, like half of the Gallic army was missing. Yeah, okay. It is very clear that uh, the Gauls had been taking notes from the Romans. I mean, they said Vercingetorix was familiar with Roman tactics, very clearly. You know, the reliance on engineering and building, the Romans loved that. And also, you know, sort of Caesar-style tactics. Um, you know, surprise attacks, taking the third option, you know, finding a different way around, surprising your enemy. Um, all of this stuff is, you know, definitely very Roman, and some of it specifically is, is similar to what Caesar does. So, you know, like I said, clearly Vercingetorix has been taking notes, and he's, he's studied up. Caesar asked one of his legates where everyone went, 
and the legate said that the Gauls had been systematically fortifying all of the surrounding hills mm. and were preparing to flank the Roman position. Wow. Apart from Labinus, the legates under Caesar's command were not exactly the sharpest knives in the drawer. <laughs> <laughs> Two legates thought it was appropriate to sit back and do nothing, while the Gauls completed a major piece of construction and occupied all of the high ground. Yeah, I got the worst fucking legates. I would be super frustrated if I was Caesar. I understand that these legates probably did not want to do something drastic without Caesar's permission. I understand and I sympathize with that because if something goes wrong, it's on you. I totally get that, but... You know, you've allowed yourself to be put in a terrible position just because you were, you know, too scared or too timid to act. There are certain times when you have to use your own brain, think independently, and act on your own initiative. And this definitely would have been one of those times. You know, fucking climbing up those hills to prevent the Gauls from taking them and fortifying them. That would have been a very good idea. Um, but uh, they didn't, of course, uh like, you know, Historius Villas just said, apart from Labinus, these were not uh, not the brightest um, individuals to have uh, leading while you're away. And that much is clear. Pretty negligent. That night, Caesar sent his cavalry into the hills. He had them ride back and forth and make as much noise as possible. He wanted to draw the Gauls' attention, and it worked. The next day, he sent his cavalry out to do the same thing, followed mm. by one of his legions. The Gauls believed that this was an all-out attack on the hills and moved to intercept them. While they were distracted, Caesar silently sent the rest of his legions forward to attack the half-strength Gallic army sitting wow. on a plateau in front of the city. Very smart. So That is very smart. So Caesar has said, well, I'm in a fucking terrible position how am I going to clear out these hills uh, and still be able to retake the city? Um, but instead of, you know, trying to do exactly that, he's relied on a bit of classic Caesar deception. He said, well, I don't actually need to retake the hills. I just need to distract them for a bit. And I can use that opportunity to climb up the main hill, uh, attack the city, and take out a Gallic force, which is not... Um, you know, fully there. They're all up on the hills, distract them, um, make a charge up the hill. Very smart. The Gauls on the plateau didn't even realize that the Romans were attacking until they were right on top of them. The legionaries were able to help each other over the stone wall without mm. much difficulty. And before the Gauls were able to mount a defense, the Romans were running amok in their camp. The Gauls on the hills quickly figured out what was happening. They immediately turned away from the decoy cavalry and started flooding down the hills to meet the Romans on the plateau. When Caesar saw the Gauls coming down the hills, he sounded the signal to retreat. But half of his men didn't hear the signal oh, and no. continued moving forward. The Gauls from the hills crashed into the oblivious Romans, who took heavy losses. They eventually realized that they were out there on their own with no Ooh. support and pulled back to rejoin the rest of the Roman army. Yeah, that just seems uh, unlucky, basically, on Caesar's part. That is uh, an unlucky artifact of warfare of this era. You know, it would be very hard to communicate to your men, <laughs> uh, especially across large distances, and sometimes they simply just wouldn't hear you. And they get yourself into a bad situation like this but still a smart plan from the Gauls a smart response from the Romans the two are uh, playing on a very intelligent level here um, but you know just an unfortunate unlucky uh, situation there not having all of his men retreat instantly for Caesar Caesar says in his commentaries that 700 Roman soldiers died because of this mistake, but later historians have argued that it was probably several thousand. Whoa. Caesar tries his best to deflect blame for this, calling his men overeager and overconfident, but mm. obviously this was Caesar's fault. It would have been clever if it worked, but the Gauls were too quick. Vercingetorix was making an effort to- True. Uh, I mean, I agree with that. I don't think it was a bad plan. I think it was a good plan. Honestly, I think it was pretty intelligent, but I think Astorius Villas is right that Gauls were just too quick for it. Um, you know, I, I do think it was a very good plan, 
but it just wasn't going to work this time. You know, this is a, a kind of a different class of enemy that Caesar is facing. You know, they're familiar with his tactics, and they're also quick to respond. So, you know, while uh, I'm not necessarily going to hit Caesar too hard for this plan, which I felt like was a pretty good idea, I mean, yes, at the end, uh, any losses suffered would be his fault. It was his idea. Um, just shows you the sort of enemy uh, he's fighting at this point to impose some much needed discipline on the Gallic army. And obviously this was starting to pay off. Mm. When news spread of Caesar's defeat at Gergovia, Rome's last Gallic ally finally flipped and went over to Vercingetorix. Yeah, of course. The Gallic cavalry accompanying Caesar unceremoniously rode off <laughs> and any Romans that were found in that tribe's territory were rounded up and killed. Mm. Gaul was now unified in its opposition to Caesar. Yikes. Up north, Labinus had actually been pretty successful and had a few small victories under his belt. Caesar marched north to regroup with him and caught up somewhere near the Seine River. Hmm. Together, the ten legions marched south again. Around this time, there started to be reports that a Gallic army was marching toward Transalpine Gaul again, which was a bad sign. Uh oh, not again. Caesar decided to ignore these reports and focus his attention on Vercingetorix and his army. I guess Caesar does have a lot on his plate right now. <laughs> He's, you know, hearing this report, probably thinking, I already have to deal with Vercingetorix and his formidable Gallic army. I mean, at least so far, it's been formidable and very challenging. I do not have the time to worry about Gallic encroachments on Roman territory. Um, uh, which, I mean, yeah. Uh, Caesar, he's got a lot going on, and he has been struggling in this episode so far. I mean, he has been, you know, classic Caesar. He hasn't been performing uh, worse than usual. It's just he's facing a really tough enemy. As he was marching south, Caesar sent ambassadors to a bunch of German tribes, politely asking if they would loan him some cavalry. Hmm. Kinda hypocritical on his part, since whenever the Gauls did this, he treated it like a war crime. Yeah. Some of these tribes were still interested in staying on Caesar's good side and were glad to help. We don't know the exact number, but maybe a couple thousand horsemen crossed the Rhine to join Caesar's army. While this was going on, Vercingetorix leveraged his victory at Gergovia to squeeze an additional 15,000 cavalry from the tribes under him. Whoa. Vercingetorix had an idea. He wanted to use some of his new cavalry to overwhelm Caesar's column as it was marching south. He selected his cavalry and made them swear an oath that they would not return home until they had ridden twice through the Roman column. Whoa. The Gauls found Caesar's column, and before the Romans even knew what was happening, they charged. They attacked in three large groups, and the Romans responded by frantically getting into three impromptu squares. To their credit, the Roman infantry held their ground against this wave of cavalry. Yeah, I mean, um, whatever you want to say about the Roman forces, and I've said this before, you got to admit that this is a rather well-trained, well-disciplined group of infantrymen, uh, and they were pretty good <laughs> at quickly and without much warning getting into formation and holding their ground. Um, you know, uh, you know, if they were good at anything, and they were good at many things, but if they were good at one thing, it was standing strong and pushing forward. This is what the Roman infantry were best at. So... You know, shout out to them for that, and you know, I'm not necessarily surprised they did manage to hold their ground, uh, even in a dangerous situation like this. Caesar's new German cavalry was significantly outnumbered, but they were able to use the Roman squares as protection, behind which they could launch hit-and-run attacks. Mm. The Gauls suffered more losses than they had expected, and after a time, they pulled back. Yeah, I mean, sort of a hit-and-run tactic from Vercingetorix. Um, it's not a terrible idea, but it does seem that he sort of underestimated how quickly the Romans would be able to respond in this instance. Vercingetorix decided to regroup at a city called Elysia. Mm. 
Some of you may have heard of the Battle of Elysia because I did a video on it all the way back in Dinosaur Times. If you want a detailed account of what happened, I would encourage you to go and watch that. There will be a link at the end of this video. But for the time being, here's the one minute version. Caesar arrived in Elysia and quickly realized that the army inside the walls outnumbered his. Mm. He constructed an elaborate series of walls. Ah, uh, yeah. I, I do believe I've heard of this battle. Um, quite a crazy scenario to be in, but uh, I think he's going to tell it to us here. That encircled the entire hillside. This was impressive. But before construction was complete, Vercingetorix sent messengers all over Gaul, asking mm. for assistance. Caesar didn't want to be attacked by a second army, so he built a second series of walls facing the two, outward. The two this walls. was even more impressive. Eventually, a giant Gallic relief army showed up, and Caesar was outnumbered at least three to one. On the first day, both armies attacked, but the Romans repulsed them. Then the relief army tried to attack at night, but that also didn't work. The next day, both armies attacked for a third and final time, and they broke through the outer wall. It got really bad, but in desperation, Caesar led a cavalry charge around the outer wall and hit the Gauls in the rear, which threw them into chaos. The Gallic relief army fled, and the next day, Vercingetorix surrendered. Whew. I do wish we could have gotten the account of the battle here, but we've got the whole video on this battle to watch, so that'll be fun. But yeah, this battle's famous for the two-wall situation, um, which very much, I think, exemplifies the Roman sort of obsession with engineering in battle uh, and building, building their way out of issues. <laughs> Um, though, of course, in the end, Caesar did manage to win this one, though it was a relatively close victory. When Vercingetorix surrendered, he put on some beautiful ceremonial armor and rode mm. out of the city. He circled the Roman camp on horseback and then dismounted, stripped off his armor, and sat silently on the ground. I mean, he, he frankly deserves the ceremony. This has got to be one of the toughest enemies the Romans one of the toughest individual enemies, I mean, that the Romans have faced. Um, you know, he's a memorable character. Um, and, you know, like I said, you know, he, he deserves to uh, surrender in style. The Romans came forward and took him into custody. He would be their prisoner for the next six years. Wow. Over the course of history, Vercingetorix's status in the popular imagination has evolved. Mm. For a long time, he was considered a minor historical figure, who briefly had his moment in the sun. And then, with the invention of nationalism in the 19th century, French artists began to look back for hints of their national identity in the ancient world. What they discovered was somebody who led a war in the defense of liberty against that tyrant Julius Caesar. That how very French of him. <laughs> That's how we get paintings like Vercingetorix by Henri Paul Mott. He yeah, there's a lot of fantastic art of Vercingetorix, and you know, it really is an interesting thing that with the development of modern nationalism, you have countries like, say, France and Germany, who look back into ancient history and start to draw inspiration and you know feel some connection with a lot of these ancient tribes that we've covered throughout these videos, even though, uh, in reality, the, you know, <laughs> an ancient tribe, an ancient Gallic tribe in the modern nation of France, the connection's not that strong <laughs> at all, if there is any, um, but, you know, uh, you know, that's sort of how this develops with nationalism, this connection is, uh, felt strongly and developed by writers, artists, academics, etc., to foster, uh, you know, the idea of the nation, the French nation, the German nation. Very, uh, you know, interesting period in modern history and very interesting phenomenon. He shows us Vercingetorix's surrender in front of a French landscape destroyed by the Roman war machine. The Romans in the foreground look sickly and pale, while Vercingetorix sits defiantly atop his horse in golden mm. armor. His hair blows in the breeze, like some kind of Greek hero. Blood and discarded Roman weapons litter the ground at his feet. In the distance, we see Caesar menacingly watching on from some kind of makeshift throne. Yeah, I mean, it's very obvious that, um, you know, Vercingetorix in this painting 
is portrayed as he's the hero figure. <laughs> he's very clearly the hero, uh, you know, coming to sadly surrender against, uh, surrender to these villainous Romans, with Caesar <laughs> being the, you know, playing the role of the main villain. And here we get another version of the same event, with mm. Vercingetorix throws down his arms at the feet of Caesar by Lionel Raye. Yes, yeah, Caesar, and this sort of ties into the perception of Roman history, and particularly Caesar uh, in, you know, modern times. And the perception of Caesar has, you know, really been quite diverse. Um, you know, if we talk about the 18th and 19th centuries, which is when these paintings are from, this era um, of enlightenment into the Romantic era, um, Caesar... You know, there's different views of Caesar. To some, Caesar is this, you know, conquering general. Um, he's a very impressive figure, and many uh, in this era take inspiration from that. Napoleon, Frederick the Great. Um, but to others, to a lot of, say, Enlightenment thinkers in the 18th century, Caesar was uh, a tyrant. You know, they despised him for his brutality and his tyranny. Um, and of course him, you know, basically ending the Roman Republic. Um, and this is how a lot of, you know, enlightenment, more liberty minded individuals felt about Caesar. Um, of course, in these images, we're seeing sort of definitely a more negative <laughs> villainous take on Caesar. Um, but, you know, opinions on him vary, you know, and still vary to this day. I think he's a, he's a complex figure and people feel a variety of different things about him. Vercingetorix gets a hero's treatment once more and remains on horseback even in defeat. Mm. His weapons have been thrown to the ground, but if we look closely, we see a Roman shield down there too, which mm. offers us a hint of past Gallic victories. By the way, in case we were confused as to who the bad guys were in this painting, look at these faces. Yeah. One more. Here's Vercingetorix calls the Gauls to the defense of Elysia by mm. François-Emile Hermann. Here we've abandoned all pretense. Vercingetorix is just blatantly shown as a young hero, straight out of Greek mythology. Instead of wearing a lion skin like Heracles, he's wearing a wolf skin, which makes us think of Rome. He seems to have the support of the people and of the gods, but this guy knows that it ends in defeat. <laughs> yeah, it's really interesting to analyze art throughout history. Um, because it really does give us a good look into what people, or at least what certain people, were feeling uh, at different times throughout history. And art depicting historical events can give us a look into how people conceived of history, particularly their own history, if we're looking at it from a nationalistic perspective. Speaking of Vercingetorix's defeat, once news of it spread throughout Gaul, most of the remaining Gallic armies disappeared, including the one marching toward Roman territory to the south. Mm. Every tribe in Gaul sent ambassadors to Caesar, officially offering their surrender. The Romans were going to be in Gaul for the foreseeable future. And I mean, fair enough, this was sort of the last, well, I don't know if it was, but it was presented in this video as sort of the last major effort. Um, of the Gauls against the Romans, and this was a serious unification. Um, Vercingetorix put up quite a fight, uh, you know, an impressive effort against the Romans, and still he lost. So after that, you can't blame a lot of the tribes for thinking, I think we lost, you know, we're going to have to learn to live under Roman control. I mean, there's not much more we can do at this point. We really tried. Um, and so, you know, we see... That, uh, that process occurring of them surrendering and, you know, trying to learn to live with their new circumstances. Sure. The next year, some of the survivors of Elysia regrouped at the city of, oh boy, Exila Dunum in southwestern mm. Gaul, where support for the Romans was the weakest. The Romans besieged the city for most of the year and eventually figured out how to poison the water supply, after which the Gauls surrendered. In the aftermath, Caesar was particularly cruel. He mm. gathered up everybody from 
Excella Dunum, <laughs> who had taken up arms against him and cut off both of their hands. Jesus. Then he just released them. This would be Caesar's last atrocity in Gaul. Oh, well, there you go. <laughs> um, Caesar's last of many atrocities, uh, many of which we've seen throughout this series, uh, and many of which we probably you know, may not even know about because uh, lack of sources. As we wrap up, I just want to take a moment and talk in general terms about the Gallic Wars. Mm. The whole thing took place over like eight or so years, and it might have been the most disruptive thing that ever happened to the region. Whoa. Plutarch makes the claim that over this period, the Romans killed a million Gauls and oh. sold another million into slavery. Holy shit. Uh, well, I'm not sure how accurate those numbers are, but those are some very large numbers. I don't know what the population of the region was, but that is immense. Though, of course, I, I don't know if those numbers are even close to accurate. Some estimate that this could have accounted for a fifth of Gaul's total population. Uh, wow. The demographic consequences of this cannot be overstated. Yeah. It would take centuries for Roman Gaul to return to its pre-invasion population levels. Yeah, I mean, particularly, I mean, in modern times, population increases very quickly, but, you know, this is ancient times, so losing that number of people, that percentage of your population, yeah, it would take you a very long time to recover that. Some historians argue that the best way to describe what happened during the Gallic Wars is to use the word genocide. The use of that word makes others upset, but hmm. I don't think there's any question that Caesar deliberately targeted specific Gallic tribes for the purpose of making them cease to exist. Yeah, I suppose you could call it that. I mean, I think the word genocide gets applied to a lot of different historical atrocities. Um, and I, I don't feel qualified to judge whether this wi was or was not a genocide. It was definitely brutal, um, you know, and a lot of atrocities were committed. Um, so, yeah, I mean, everyone can make up their own minds on that. Uh, I feel that <laughs> I would need to be a lot more knowledgeable, and we would probably need a lot more information than we have to maybe, um, you know, use the word genocide. But maybe not. Maybe it was. Uh, I'm, I'm really not sure, but either way, it was uh, truly brutal. He deliberately destroyed Gallic demographics. If that's not genocide, I don't know what is. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I, I do see that point. For calling the entire thing genocide may be too broad, but definitely campaigns against certain tribes whom Caesar purposefully killed, enslaved, um or basically destroyed their homes uh, and kicked them out. I mean, yeah, that, that absolutely would be described as genocide, definitely. Anyway, by the year 50 BCE, Caesar would extend the borders of the nearest Roman province all the way north to the English Channel, Whoa. west to the Atlantic Ocean, and east to the Rhine River. We don't know exactly when this change went into effect, or if he even bothered to ask for the Senate's approval before doing it. <laughs> but we know that by the end of Caesar's term as governor, Gaul was officially paying taxes into the Roman treasury. And over time, Gaul would become very Romanized. Um, it would, like the other provinces, it would be thoroughly integrated into the empire. Um, to a point where you couldn't even imagine, you know, Gauls not being part of the Roman Empire. That's how thoroughly integrated we're talking. I mean, it would take a while to get there, but they would be Romanized, absolutely. Despite the heroic struggle of the Gallic tribes, full annexation had gone into effect. Alrighty. That was an interesting one. Um, ended on a bit of a somber note. <laughs> Um, you know, it is sometimes hard to make moral judgments of historical figures or, or, or history. Um, that can be tough, but uh, regardless, of course, the some of the actions taken by Caesar were very brutal, and that shouldn't be overlooked. Um, but yeah, 
Definitely an interesting time period we've witnessed in Historia Civilis' videos, the conquest of Gaul um, by the Romans. Uh, and we're basically done with that at this point. We've seen a lot of videos on it. Though we still have the Battle of Elysia video coming up, which I'll react to to get you know the full story on that battle, which is, uh, I think, a pretty, <laughs> pretty crazy battle. Um, but yeah, I mean, we saw the Roman buildup of power in Gaul as they slowly conquer and dominate the region, and several attempts of the Gauls to resist, uh, all of which ended in failure. Um, but I, you know, in this video, and of course, Historia Civilis frames it this way, but you very much sympathize with Vercingetorix, you know? He makes him out to be a very um, sympathetic character, uh, particularly near the end of the video. But yeah, that was, that was an interesting one. Um, I hope you guys enjoyed this one. If you did, I'd appreciate it if you would leave a like, subscribe to the channel, and check out my Patreon, which is linked down below. Uh, I hope all you guys are having uh, a good day. I hope you'll, you're all coping well with the heat. It's very hot where I am. Uh, and I will see you all again next time. Goodbye.